Lord, thank you for that reminder and that last song, Lord, that we depend on you for everything. I'm depending on you right now. We're depending on you as we're sitting here. And Lord, our dependence upon you is by divine design. We need to be dependent upon you. You are our creator. We are creation. We've been made in your image. And you designed us to be cared for, to be dependent creatures. And Lord, we so often forget that. We really do feel like we can take the ball and run. And we can't. And God, we thank you for allowing us to be dependent upon you, Lord. We thank you for the empowering of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for giving us your good word that guides us, Lord, every step of our lives. Thank you for giving us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Thank you, God, for giving us your good book. Thank you, Lord, for putting something in our grasp, in our hands that we can read, we can study, we can memorize, and Lord, that we can live out. Thank you, Lord, that you are indeed the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And it's his name we want to exalt today in the proclamation of your word. We want you to be lifted up today, Lord. We want you to be glorified, magnified. <clears throat> Lord, we want your word to resound from this building today. And Lord, over the internet, even right now as we're streaming, we pray, Father God, that you would be exalted, Lord. We know that you are being exalted. You're being lifted up all over the country right now in pulpits nationwide, worldwide, even though we're in different time zones, Lord. <clears throat> On this day, Lord, you're being lifted up. And Lord, we want to worship you right now in the beauty of your holiness, Lord, and fear before you, <clears throat> as your scripture says, as the word says, Lord, fear before you all the earth. Lord, we bow before you right now. We ask that you would bless our time in your word and Lord, prepare our hearts for communion later on. And we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Verse eight, verse nine. Let's read through these again. <clears throat> be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Now last week we spent all of our time going through the details of verse 8. We spent, cons we spent considerable time, <clears throat> amount of time, sizing up our arch enemy, Satan. We are using an outline to work through the particulars of verses 8 and 9. The construction of this outline is based on what these verse verses teach and what they command. In verse 8, our outline showed us that the first part of verse 8 deals with the urgent duty of alertness. We have a duty to be alert. That's what the text says. The second part of verse 8 shows us the vivid portrayal of the enemy. The enemy is described. Satan is described. In verse 9, number 3 of our outline <coughs> speaks of the need for firm resistance to Satan. And then the last part of verse nine, number four in our outline, is the encouraging reminder concerning the brotherhood. I again want to encourage those who were not here last week to please listen or watch whatever you're gonna do, <clears throat> the teaching from last week, because you'll definitely need that information to track with what we're covering today. Last week, we looked very closely at the sobering reality 
<clears throat> that Satan is seeking to bring us down. Sometimes Christians become weakened through trial and persecution, and we know that the devil is opportunistic. Just as he did with a confused, despondent, proud disciple named Peter when he sifted him, our foe is looking to pounce. When a lion roams about, it's time for caution at the sheepfold. The lion's roar, roar, that's a hard word for me to say, as I said last week. The lion's roar creates fear, and sometimes frightened sheep may bolt from the flock to become easy prey. The historical backdrop of the text here before us presents the very high probability that part of the method the enemy would use to gain access to their hearts was through pressure caused by persecution. And capitulation can be a very tempting way to relieve the stress from the pressure of being associated with Jesus Christ. That's how Peter failed in his sifting. I don't know the man. That was his way out. When confronted about his identification with Jesus, Peter denied knowing him. Now, it's very easy to feel invincible in a setting like this when we are surrounded by those of like mind. But the enemy prowls around looking for any way he can find to get in. Trials that stem from belonging to Christ are just one of the many sources of entry that he is looking for. So, with such a formidable foe, how do we respond? Now, many of us already know the answer, but that's what we're going to take the time to focus on today for the remainder of our time today. We can't spend so much time looking at the capabilities of our mortal enemy and do that so much that we're paralyzed by him. Satan loves when we're paralyzed by his abilities. The church is called upon to set its sight on another lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, our warrior king. Amen. So number three in our outline is contained in the very first part of verse nine. Number three is the firm resistance to Satan. Look at verse nine again. Very simple words. But resist him firm in your faith. So how does a Christian deal with a roaring lion? God's word says we resist him. Yes, he is called a lion. And he has great power, now listen to this, that no non-Christian can resist. Non-Christians can't resist him. They don't have the power to resist him. But believers are not to cower before the devil because this will lead to inevitable defeat. Resistance in faith ensures his flight. The word for resist here is actually composed of two words. There's the word, and this is in the Greek, the word anti, which means against, and then it's connected to another verb, which means to stand. <clears throat> against, to stand. And together, those words combine to make, <clears throat> to present a military metaphor. The word that's used here for resist is used also of uh, Illamis' resistance to the gospel in Acts chapter 13. It's used of Paul's opposition to Peter in Antioch in Galatians 2. It's used of Jannes and Jambres' stance against Moses in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it's also used of Alexander the coppersmith's response to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
So resistance then is not passive, but it represents active engagement against a foe. Believers will not triumph over the devil, devil, devil? Sarah, didn't you used to say that? The devil, wherever you are, (laughs) when she was little? The devil. Believers will not triumph over the devil if they remain docile. And so as a definitive act, Christians should take a solid stand in opposition to the devil as their true enemy. Scripture urges believers to flee from various trials, right? Flee fornication, flee this, flee that. But nowhere are they advised to flee from the devil. We flee from sin all day long. But we are not told to flee from Satan. That would be a futile effort. James, in giving the same command to resist the devil, adds the assuring promise, he will flee from you. Actually, read the whole verse. It says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Ephesians chapter 6 gives a very similar picture in different words when it speaks of putting on God's armor in order to stand against the stratagems of the devil, adding that it is spiritual powers against which the Christian fights, not the human agents through which they may work. The idea of resisting, of course, is rooted in the gospel narratives such as the story of the temptation of Jesus. There we see Jesus resisting the temptations of Satan. One writer said this, never reason with the devil. If we try to reason with him, we will be defeated because we are no match for his deceptions. Remember what happened to Eve? We must resist him. And there's only one way to stand up to to him and that is by using the word of God, and by prayer. Christ himself used these weapons when tempted in the wilderness. We can do no better, end quote. And to that, we all say amen. Amen. (laughs) Now, in addition to uh, verses, verse nine, being sort of a, being a parallel to James 4, 7, this is also a very, abbreviated version of the spiritual armor section in Ephesians chapter six. We're not gonna take the time to read through those verses in this lesson. We actually went through all of the armor pieces at the men's retreat this past September. That was our theme. So if you want access to those sessions, go on our YouTube page, they are there. Also, if you are looking If you look for the study that we did in Ephesians, which I do believe was back in 2016, you'll find a very exhaustive, multi-part teaching on the spiritual armor. I checked, it's on the website, so you can look for that on the YouTube page. Back to our text here. So, resistance is made, it says, firm in your faith. Firm in your faith. So this denotes the condition for victory. The word firm here, translated as steadfast, I believe in the King James Version. The word firm in a physical sense describes something as, and I'm quoting here, as firm, hard, solid, and compact like a rock, end quote. So in their inner attitude, Christians should stand firm and unyielding like granite resisting Satan. Now the phrase there, in your faith, or as regards the faith, points out the sphere or the element of victory. Faith may be understood here subjectively as denoting the Christian's 
personal confidence in God, that obviously a a firm personal faith is obviously essential. But here the objective sense of the faith, the true gospel message adhered to is also essential. Victory is not assured by the personal tenacity with which we cling to our personal beliefs. Victory lies ultimately in adhering to the work of Christ on the cross where he defeated the devil. In Christ, Satan is now a defeated foe. Victory over Satan lies in faith because faith unites us to Christ who is the victor. By faith, the devil is driven to flight as is the lion by fire. The key to Peter's survival under Satan's attack was his faith, just as our Lord had prayed for him that his faith would not fail. His faith didn't fail. He failed in that moment of sifting, but ultimately his faith didn't fail. But why is faith so essential? What makes it so important? Well, because Satan's attacks against the believer are an attack on faith itself. When Satan attempted at, tempted, excuse me, tempted Adam and Eve, he tried to induce them to act independently of God. They were urged to act independently of God by Satan, raising doubts in their hearts about the trustworthiness of God. Has God said? That's all he had to do, was just plant that thought in their mind. And they were tempted tempted to think that God was withholding something from them. And they trusted in themselves by doubting God. They trusted in Satan, they trusted in themselves, and they doubted God. And when we suffer... Satan tempts us with doubt and unbelief, trying to make us believe that God has abandoned us so that we will act independently of God to bring about what we think is in our best interest. When the fact is it's not, but we think that. That's how he's able to lure us away. One writer said this, 1 Peter overflows with reminders of the firmness of the faith of believers. And here's how he does this. We've been chosen by God the Father, given a new birth into a living hope, and provided with an inheritance that can never perish because we are shielded by God's power. Furthermore, we've been called out of darkness into God's wonderful light. God himself is building up individual believers into a spiritual house. He views his followers as a holy and royal priesthood, a holy nation and a people bring, belonging to him. This is the kind of faith in which the believer must stand firm, end quote. We've been looking at all kinds of stuff throughout this letter that reminds us of what God has done in our lives. And those are the very things that the Lord wants us to stand on. Those are the very tools that God has given us to resist the enemy. How about some cross-references for further encouragement? Turn with me, if you will, to turn to the left to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. We know these verses, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold on eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Turn to the right. That's just one verse. Turn to the right to 2 Timothy. Telling Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. 
later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, chapter 4, he says in verse 7, I have fought the good faith, excuse me, the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. He goes on from there. In the future there is laid out for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have loved his appearing. By the way, jump down to verse 16. He says, at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted, deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But notice he says, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all, <coughs> excuse me, the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord rescued me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.32 says, And what more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon, Bar Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith, Conquered kingdoms, performed acts, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, comma, etc., 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 etc. Faith. Faith. In Acts 14, 21, Paul, Barnabas, preaching the gospel to cities all over the place, making disciples. It says they returned to Lystra, and to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Hold fast to the faith. <clears throat> Stand in faith, trusting God, trusting in his completed work. I want to read to you a quote. Charles Spurgeon said this. Concerning first, you can turn on back to first Peter. Concerning first Peter, verse nine, Spurgeon said this. Resist him. But how resist him? Steadfast in the faith. Seek to obtain a clear knowledge of the doctrines of the gospel and then get a good grip of them. Be ready to die sooner than to give up a particle of God's revealed truth. This will make you strong. Then take hold of the promises of God which are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Know that to every doctrine there is some, some opposite promise. Have ready for every attack some strong word commencing with, is it written? Answer Satan with, thus saith the Lord, steadfast in the faith. Remember all the water <clears throat> outside of a ship cannot sink it. It is the water inside that perils its safety. So if, if your faith can keep its hold, you can still say, though he slay me, will I trust in him? Satan may batter your shield, but he has not wounded your flesh. The conflict may be long, but the victory is absolutely sure. Oh, poor soul, do but keep near to the cross and thou art safe. Throw thine arms around the dying Savior. Let the droppings of his blood fall on your sins. And even if you cannot see him, still believe him. Still say, I know that he came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I will cling to the sinner's Savior as my only hope and trust. Then let Satan roar. 
he cannot hurt. Let him rage. His fury is vain. He may but show his teeth, for he certainly cannot bite. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, end quote. I can't say it any better than that, so I figured I'd just read it from, from Spurgeon. Resist him, firm in your faith, number four in our outline, the encouraging reminder concerning the brotherhood. Resist him, firm in your faith, comma, next line. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. One of the great blights in our modern world is a form of the victim, victimhood mentality which laments, no one understands what I go through or what I've been through. And that's actually a very naive way of thinking. For one thing, there's nothing new under the sun. But more importantly, for the Christian, bearing one another's burdens and drawing strength from the fact that other believers do share my experiences of suffering is a powerful means of drawing strength whenever a saint is feeling beaten down by the weight of his sin or the fiery trials that he's facing in his faith, against his faith. And there are numerous verses that attest to this, including the one right here in verse nine. The knowledge that one is not alone in his experience serves to strengthen the resolve of faith and the determination not to yield to Satan's allure. However isolated one may feel, says Peter, such an ordeal is not unique, but it is actually, it says here, shared by others throughout the world. Everyone in the Christian family faces the possibility of the same rejection and discrimination. It is a mark of being part of the same family. One writer says, their sufferings are not the personal misfortune of individuals, but belong to the essence of faith and are signs of its power against evil. Even more, they are signs that faith is sustained through grace, end quote. Now the verb translated here, <clears throat> the phrase are being finished or accomplished has the sense of to finish or accomplish and it suggests that a final goal has been achieved. More is involved in standing firm in the faith than simply enduring pagan opposition. There is in some sense an appointed purpose or an end sort of wrapped up in the suffering of believers. And this is perhaps spelled out in verse 10, which we won't get to <coughs> this week, <coughs> where we are assured that when suffering has ended, believers will enter into God's eternal glory in Christ. <coughs> like I said, we'll hit on that, Lord willing, next week. Remember Jesus told his disciples, in the world you will have tribulation. All of his disciples, not just a few, we don't always go through it all at the same time, but all of his disciples will have tribulation, but then he said, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Can I read to you another Spurgeon quote? Of course I can read to you another Spurgeon quote. <laughs> On this verse, Spurgeon said this, it is likely enough that as I am speaking this morning, some of you will say, I did not think that anybody else ever felt as I feel. And though I tell you these things and know that many of you have heard Satan roar, 
I am compelled to confess that I frequently have said in my own heart, I do not believe that any other man ever had this temptation before me. Well, this text stands to refute our supposition. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Martin Luther was wont to, was wont to say that next to Holy Scripture, the best teacher for a minister was temptation. He put affliction next, but temptation he kept first in his view. When we have been tempted and tried ourselves, we know how to aid others. I grant you it is hard to have the conviction on one's mind that you are standing in a perilous place where never man stood before and tempted as never man was tempted before you. Come, believer, we will talk this matter over for two or three seconds. Certainly your Lord has been there before, for he was tempted in all points like as you are. Scripture says that all your brethren have had some participation in your trials. Now mark, as they suffered, as you suffer, no temptation has ta overtaken you, but such as is common to man. As they came through the temptation safe and, safe and unharmed, so shall you. As they testified that their light afflictions worked for them a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, so shall that be your testimony. As they have overcome and now circle the throne of God clothed in white garments, so will you. And inasmuch as their temptations have left no scars upon their brow, no stains upon their robes, no rent in their royal mantles, so neither shall Satan be able to disfigure or to mutilate you, but you shall come out of every trial and of every struggle, losing nothing therein, save that which it is well to lose, your dross and your tin, your chaff and your bran. <laughs> you shall come forth from the deep waters, washed, cleansed, and purified. God grant so that it may be with you, but it can only be so by your resisting Satan, steadfast in the faith. End quote. Amen. The Apostle Paul actually used his own example of suffering affliction numerous times to bring encouragement to the saints that he wrote to. And one of my favorites is one we're going to turn to right now. If you will, turn to the left to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Many of you probably know where I'm going. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want you to look how this reads. Follow the flow of this. knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, knowing that, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that, underline that, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you catch that? Notice verse three, or excuse me, verse five. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. 
And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. Did you follow all that? Now look what he says next. For, there's our connecting word, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Did you catch that? This is how bad it was, brothers, sisters. So bad that we despaired of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. In other words, we kept going knowing that, well, live or die, we're the Lord's. So we just keep going, right? Notice he says, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope. And he will yet deliver us. You also, joining in helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. <clears throat> so I'm making you aware of this, Paul is saying. <clears throat> And we're going through this, but we know that as we're going through this and word gets out that we're going through this, that is going to stimulate the prayers of the saints. So they're praying for us. We're praying for them. We're all praying for each other because God is doing a work through all of us. We're not always going through trials at the same time. You hear about me going through a trial well, you bear, we bear one another's burdens. So you pray for me and your prayers strengthen me, bring encouragement to my heart, hold me up, you know, Aaron, her, that kind of a thing, Moses' arms, right? The arms are being held up through the prayers of the saints. <clears throat> but Paul here says, I don't want you to be unaware of the kind of affliction that we were facing. And he says this to the Corinthians, trying to encourage them, hey, look, we were encouraged. God brought strength to us. We can expect that as you're going through the same things we're going through, that God's gonna bring that same encouragement to you. In fact, you can count on it because that's how God works. And of course, we have 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which I already alluded to, which says that no temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you were able but with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. We also have first, uh, excuse me, Revelation 1.9. John says, your brother and fellow partaker, partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Christ Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John said, I'm a I'm a fellow partaker of the sufferings and I'm here in exile based upon my proclamation of the word of God. Here I sit suffering because of that. Now, there's also that very interesting little story in 1 Kings when Elijah came to a cave and lodged there and the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. It's just me, God. I'm all alone. <laughs> Later, God, after encouraging him, feeding his, his servant, the Lord said, it shall come about that the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the, knees who have, all the knees that have not 
bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, Elijah, you're not really alone. You might feel isolated right now. You might feel like, you might feel like you're the only one who knows what it's like to go through this, but you are not and neither are we, ever. And the good thing is, is that we see saints being brought through various trials and we know, well, God brought them through that. He will bring me through that too. And so we have this kind of reciprocal thing going on. I suffer, you suffer, we pray for each other. I see the Lord bring you through your trial and I'm still in mine and that gives me hope knowing, well, and God's going to bring me through mine as well. And that actually is one of the ways that we defeat the enemy. That's one of the ways we resist Satan. We resist Satan knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in our brethren who are in the world. Amen? Amen. Now, to prepare us for communion today, I'd like us to be reminded of somebody else who suffered for us. <clears throat> our Lord and our King, I'd like you to go to Hebrews chapter two. Those of you that are gonna hand out communion, if you guys wanna go ahead and start doing that, band members, whoever's gonna be leading us in song later, you can go ahead and step on up here. And the rest of us are gonna turn to Hebrews chapter two. We're going to read through some passages there. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things. I'll go ahead and grab this now. Thank you. Excuse me. And through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Yes, sometimes I wish it wasn't so, but that's the way God has designed it. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which, re- for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children, the people of God, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, speaking of Jesus, suffering as a man, he is able to come to the aid of those who are being tempted. Now we think of our brethren throughout the world who are being afflicted like we are. The model is the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus who bore upon himself the weight of our sins. He suffered solely for the glory of God and for us. Amen? Now when we jump over to chapter 4 of Hebrews, 
we find these other encouraging words related to the words we just read in chapter 2. Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Talk about standing firm in the faith. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you need mercy today? Are you feeling the weight of affliction? Are you feeling the weight of your sin? <clears throat> Are you feeling a need, the need for your king? He's not too high and lifted up that he's unapproachable. He has made a way for us to approach the throne of grace so that we may find mercy and grace to help us in time of need. Amen? Amen. So, let us approach him right now as we prepare <clears throat> to do this in remembrance of him. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we confess our need, Lord. As we sang just moments ago, we depend on you. And once again, God, we thank you for that dependence. We thank you, Lord, for opening up our eyes and helping us to see, Lord, how utterly deficient we were. And we thank you, Lord, for your profound, eternal sympathy. We thank you, Lord, that you suffered on our behalf, that you brought, that we can bring the weight of our own suffering to you and unload that burden upon you, Lord, because you understand us more than anybody else does. Your understanding of us is infinite. We are finite, you are infinite. And God, we come before you right now and we confess our need of you. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us these reminders, these symbols of redemption. We thank you, Lord, that we stand here today in victory because a work has been finished. A declaration <clears throat> was given. It is finished. And you gave up the ghost you cried out in victory right before you died. And Lord, we thank you for the victory that we now have because we belong to you. And Lord, we partake of this bread and this cup in remembrance of you, giving thanks to you because you are good. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's eat together. Let's drink together. And let's thank him together. Thank you, Lord, so much. Thank you, God, that we can resist the enemy. Thank you, Lord, that we can resist him with authority and with power, with real authority that comes from on high. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's sing to our Lord. Yeah.
Jesus, you reign, you reign. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done in our hearts today, all that you continue to do, Lord. We ask you to bless the fellowship that will happen downstairs in just a few minutes. And Lord, give everyone safe travel to wherever they're going today. Thank you, Father, for filling us up for the rest of this week now. Let us go out and be lights to this darkening world, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.